Nishtibra was bored. Depressed would be a more accurate word for her state of apathy. Her people always ended in such a state after strong emotional reactions like the one she had experienced not that many cycles ago. Her opera manipulators touched the desk for a moment. It was her duty to keep monitoring the Zarkin Dominion and their actions, but everything had gone wrong. So wrong. Where did this even start? Nishdibra had heard the news. The Galactic community was in shock after a heated discussion between the Zarkin Chancellor and the Bell Aval representative had ended with an accident. A terrible accident. The Zarkin used a succession system in which, if a ruler died or showed that he was unfit for their position, the second most voted candidate would take over for the remaining of the original mandate. The Zarkin Chancellor was dead. Due to the stress of the argument, some of his vital organs started to fail. The image of his body lying upon the grandstand had reached all corners of the galaxy. Rumours about poisoning soon started to rush through all communication networks, for it was extremely rare for a Zarkin to die because of stress. This would have been just that, an unfortunate accident if not for who the Zarkin were. Their civilization was marvellous, holding the key to teleportation technology, space and energy manipulation, and a level of bioengineering that the rest of the galactic community could only dream of. They also had the largest military fleet of the known galaxy, with hundreds of ships and even more ships being produced every macrocycle. They would rarely go to war since the size of their fleet was the best detriment element. However, a sizable portion of Zarkin society was in favour of waging war against civilizations and peoples deemed too primitive or too destructive for their own environment and home planets. A great political movement had taken place, giving way to the rise of the Extermination for Peace Party, which soon became the second most voted political force in the Zarkin Dominion. Which was curious to say the least, since the Zarkinian people had not suffered any war in their own world since more than 2,000 standard macro cycles ago. And now the Extermination for Peace Party were in power. Mere seconds after being proclaimed new Chancellor, the new leader of the Zarkin Dominion, as chief of all armies and fleets, ordered the extermination of the peaceful Iavria, a primitive people with many different subcultures, some of which have started a process of industrialization on their planet for the first time in their long history. They were famous for their ancient art pieces and beautiful tapestries. But all their history and legacy were gone. Barely a few mesocycles ago, the Zarkin fleet had arrived in the system, sending a scout force to the planet's surface in order to secure specimens of the local wildlife in order to modify them and turn them into genetically modified weapons. The gene moulds of the fleet soon created an army of flock mines, modified to rapidly reproduce, ready to devastate their own homeworld and take over as the new dominant species. The rest was easy. A fleet of teleportation ships would simply drop continuous hordes of the creatures upon the main population centres. Of course, it had been a massacre. After that, some ships of the main fleet entered into the atmosphere in order to fully annihilate any possible remains of the Avri of Resistance with heavy plasma fire. With the destruction of the few strongholds they had left, the creatures unleashed by the Zarkin fleet soon took over the planet. A few agents of the galactic community had managed to evacuate some Iavria of world in secret, but their entire planet, and the entire crucible of cultures that was their planet, was gone forever. Nishtibra cried for several standard microcycles after that. Her six eyes would not stop mourning the loss of so many lives. Then, her people had called for her. She was to monitor the movements of the Zarkin extermination fleet and report all their movements to her superiors. She was able to monitor the activities of the fleet thanks to a back door that had allowed them to use Zarkin sensors without the knowledge of the extermination fleet. The last couple of cycles had been uneventful at best, making Nishtibra slide into a state of apathy since all she could do was watch. Apparently the extermination fleet had found a new target, a backwater world in the Exvilius sector. Not many records existed about that place, and the ones that existed were contradictory at best. Some files declared that the planet was inhabited by an intelligent species called humans, while others said that there were no intelligent life forms on the planet, just a subspecies of a creature called primate that had started to develop their culture not that long ago. The fleet had started their pre-invasion protocols once again, collecting samples of the local fauna in order to later use them as weapons. Everything was going as usual. 
The teleportation ships descended upon the most dense population centers, and the plasma batteries were almost ready. But then, as they approached the planet, a small terrestrial world with a single moon, something happened. From the surface, a volley of projectiles rise towards the incoming fleet. Two motherships suffered the full brunt of the first impacts, since their shields were lowered. It was clear that this wasn't a simple backwater world. These barbarians were willing to enter into a radiation war with whoever approached their planet. The next cycles were interesting. The biological weapons were successfully deployed, but then again, this was not a regular planet, and this was certainly not any primitive civilization. The bioweapon numbers were kept at a minimum since the natives were killing them faster than they could reproduce. According to Omnis Census, the humans were using every advantage they had. Kinetic weapons were considered primitive, and yet, the bioweapons were being killed by the hundreds. Soon, humans escalated their response, using weapons that had been forbidden by the galactic community. Chemical weapons, artillery strikes, saturation bombardment with high-yield explosives, vehicles with guided explosive projectiles, and well-planned defence grids composed of point defence turrets were tearing apart any presence the bioweapons could have on the surface. The Zarkin fleet was confused. And then, it happened. The first teleportation ship was shot down by the humans. The next local cycle, a second one fell. Then the third, the fourth, and the fifth. Only then did the Zarkinians react. Famous were the Zarkinian world foundries, not because of their diligence, but because of the great machinations of war they produced. From the most humble seek and kill drone, to the gargantuan quadrupled fortress, their mine drones, the mechanizations toiled in world foundries, remote under heavy security. The extermination fleet started an escalated deployment, first sending in swarms of seek and kill drones to call attention away from the bioweapons in order to buy them the time they needed to reproduce. However, the Zarkinians had severely underestimated the flight capabilities of the human armies, as well as their combat capabilities. The swarms of drones were soon shot down by human aircrafts and anti-air defense systems. The number of drones started to dwindle so much that the extermination fleet had to commission more to the world foundries in order to keep up with the casualties. Soon after, the order was given, and the Zarkinians deployed everything they had. The walking mechanical giants meant for long-range combat, known as the... Indectors, armed with plasma weapons and a built-in self-destruction mechanism in order to avoid enemy capture, were the first of this second wave to be deployed. And once again, the humans managed to use the tall design of this new threat as an advantage, for it was easy to see them from vast distances, allowing for more versatile retreats and attacks. What followed were monstrous mechanizations considered to be nightmarish at best. The walking war tripods of the Zarkin Dominion finally saw battle after more than a hundred standard macro cycles in storage. They were perfect against entrenched enemies, thanks to the plasma cannons on their legs, and for long-range artillery strikes, at least what the interstellar law considered an appropriate artillery strike, since the plasma projectiles were extremely slow for humans, who could be seen easily dodging the plasma bubbles when needed. But not even the might of the war tripods was enough to strike fear into the humans, for they soon discovered that this new enemy had no anti-air defences, and therefore it was an easy prey for the human bombers and aircrafts. It made sense, since the war tripods were designed to destroy primitive civilizations with no air flight capabilities. Nishtibra imagined the war room of the extermination fleet, full of bafflement, perplexity, and even some delightful notes of fear. This thought comforted her for some cycles, seeing this series of defeats as the universe's revenge against these genocidal maniacs for their crimes. Not long after, the Zarkinian High Command authorised the deployment of the only forbidden weapon in their arsenal, the Quadrupled Fortress. Imposing machines armed with all sorts of weapon, especially with what was known as the Genocide Marker, a weapon so powerful that it could erase entire cities from existence in the blink of an eye, and it could even pose a serious threat for orbiting warships. If that wasn't enough, the Quadrupled Fortress were equipped with self-regenerating armor plates, courtesy of a swarm of nanobots controlled by the onboard systems. Eight quadrupled fortresses were deployed. Defense grids were destroyed in an instant. Bomber fleets shot down by the massive cannons of the fortresses, and entire human battalions were simply erased by volumes of high-velocity plasma shots. This turn of events allowed the bioweapons to proliferate and give the Sarkinian forces the upper hand in the conflict. Human beings seem to be heading directly to extinction, even after holding these Arcanian forces for more than 156 local Mesa cycles. 
It seemed inevitable. And of course, no other nations in the galaxy were willing to stop it. This was the end for these noble barbarians as well, felt Nishdibra. Five local mesocycles later, the unthinkable happened. One of the powerful quadrupled fortresses was destroyed. The first question in the mind of Nishdibra was, how? According to Omnis sensors, a small group of human soldiers had closed in on the fortress, managed to infiltrate the massive megastructure, killed the operators, disable the automated self-repair, and destroy the plasma core of the reactor. The results were catastrophic for the fortress, exploding in an ocean of plasma that turned the earth into glass. Only 50 locomotorcycles later, the eight fortresses had been destroyed, using the same method or some variations, including the use of hydrogen bombs to temporarily disable the fortress and its systems. The Zarkinian High Command was furious, and desperate enough to demand that the world's foundries build new quadrupled fortresses faster, which stirred outrage in many workers. Finally, the Chancellor decided to step in, assuring that he would personally teach these aliens to kneel before their betters. A political manoeuvre created to increase his popularity ratings, of course. All Zarkinian ships left the atmosphere of that accursed planet, as the mothership of the Chancellor descended into one of the few population centres left intact. There, he exited his ship and was met by a group of human soldiers and a small aircraft. With a haughty attitude, the Chancellor gave a few steps on the surface of that strange world. He gestured towards one of the humans, but something strange happened. Suddenly a hole appeared on his hand and on his shoulder. Blood started to pour out, and the Chancellor surely realised he had made a severe mistake. A group of twenty human soldiers formed a line before him. They were all armed. They were all probably furious after the invasion. They all started shooting until the Chancellor was nothing but a puddle of his own blue blood. The Chancellor was dead. The Zarkin Dominion quickly appointed a new Chancellor, and the Dominion left the system, never to return to the only undeveloped world who had managed to oppose them and win. Nishdibra wrote her final report, satisfied with the turn of events that had led to the humiliating defeat of the Zarkin. She inscribed a petition of peaceful and distant contact with the humans in about 50 standard macro cycles to the High Council, and hope for the best.